Okay, we're live. We're here with uh, Tom Coughlin, Matt Polka, and Patty Boyers. And uh, it's very exciting to bring friends together from all coasts, including the Missouri coast. So yeah. we've, got, <laughs> we've got a great, great uh, conversation planned for today. And I'm here somewhere too. I'm going to turn my camera on. There it is. Oh, I'm in the lower right Ken pile here with Viotti. And uh, we're going to talk about COVID-19 resources that the IEEE USA, and I did not correct that image. I'm sorry about that, Tom. The IEEE, IEEE USA has, as well as ACA, Ameri ACA Connects, what they're doing with their members. And then we're going to go into a bit of a conversation about broadband and uh, really pretty much anything we feel like, I suppose. Maybe the price of beef, where it's going. Right. <laughs> Patty can talk to that. So uh, with that, uh, there we go. We've got Tom, Matt, and uh, Patty, Patricia, Joe. What we want to do is go to Tom's presentation. Tom is going to uh, talk to um, the efforts of IEEE USA. And I've known Tom for uh, a number of years. He's um, He's been uh, a great volunteer, and that's one of the threads of this conversation today. We have three people who do an inordinate amount of volunteering work uh, for their communities. And whether those communities are across the country, uh, in the case of IEEE USA, ACA Connects similarly, or in their community, uh, the way Matt is doing some really cool volunteering uh, with his church. And I, I want to talk to that later in the conversation, so remind me if I forget. But in the meantime, let's pull up Tom's presentation here. And I just have to hit the present menu. Tom, why don't you take it away and tell us about what IEEE USA is doing? Sure. Well, first of all, IEEE, uh, uh, IEEE USA is part of IEEE, and IEEE is the largest technical professional organization in the world with uh, over 400,000 members worldwide and uh, hundreds of thousands of members in the U.S. And uh, the, the members in the U.S. Are, then are part of IEEE USA. And IEEE USA has a focus on uh, public policy. They actually have their headquarters in Washington, D.C., and um, also in career and member services. But uh, I'm going to talk today a bit on things that IEEE USA and IEEE, IEEE overall have been doing um, in response to the COVID-19. So next slide, please. So uh, IEEE USA uh, uh, is here to help uh, the members of IEEE in particular. And um, uh, we've got resources that are on a, uh, a resource portal here, which is uh, HTTP uh, colon backslash backslash IEEEUSA.org slash help. And uh, we're focusing on uh, several important key areas. Uh, those include um, if people are at home, uh, they have a little bit extra time, uh, professional development career tools, or maybe even they've lost their job, right? Um, our public policy activities, which are still ongoing, even though uh, people are uh, working out of their homes, uh, news and information. And then we also have some interesting morale boosters uh, that are uh, meant to be a resource for for members as well as their families. So uh, we got, uh, uh, in addition to this uh, uh, dedicated help portal, we also have some email resources we've got. We got an insight uh, update newsletter, which goes out monthly to members in the U.S. And we also have a smart brief uh, weekly newsletter done with various partners. And then uh, there's a social media campaign that IEEE USA has on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And in addition to things IEEE USA is doing, uh, the larger IEEE organization uh, has their own COVID page, and uh, uh, they also are sending out weekly IEEE membership bulletins uh, to help their members. So next slide, please. So uh, some of these uh, resources, a little more detail. Uh, here, IEEE USA help page. Uh, latest news and resources to cope with uh, COVID-19. Uh, it's updated several times per week, new feature items always at the top. Um, this is including uh, uh, items from IEEE USA as well as uh, uh, IEEE. And uh, then again, as I mentioned before, we have these two different email uh, things. So you can see examples here. By the way, this uh, IEEE Explore is, IEEE publishes um, a, a, a significant proportion of the uh, world's engineering uh, literature, and uh, they've made available, um, uh, I think it's over 140 different articles re that have relationship to pandemics or COVID uh, for free access. You know, ordinarily people would pay uh, to get access to that, but they've uh, they've done that. 
Uh, next slide. And uh, uh, professional development. So we've got uh, uh, this week uh, free online publication, new articles from industry experts. That's the insight. Um, it's it's uh, done weekly, but we also send out uh, an email with links to all these items uh, to our members. And um, uh, we also have uh, have had for some time uh, built up a collection of over 150 uh, eBooks uh, that cover topics like career services, communications. Uh, public policy and a lot of other interesting issues. And these are now available for free to IEEE members worldwide. Next slide. Um, so IEEE uh, uh, also, in addition to eBooks, uh, has various webinars they've done that are recorded or you can catch them live. Uh, they've covered things like job hunting skills, personal branding. Uh, we have over 225 of these. And actually I have one that I did back a couple years ago uh, which is more on the hobby side, which was uh, a webinar on making beer, if you're interested. Um, our IEEE uh, uh, government relations team continues to advocate for members, uh, IEEE members during this time. And our uh, government relations director, Russ Harrison, who you can see there on the right, offers updates um, on things going on on Capitol Hill. You can see where he gave a talk not that long ago on the uh, CARES Act and the small business loans that are available. Uh, there's a link uh, there to uh, that information. And then um, uh, various recordings, uh, video recordings have been done of things such as the IEEE USA uh, EVO 19 conference and past future leaders forums. We've got recordings of those now available on our YouTube page. There's that link there. Next slide. And uh, career tools. We know that there are uh, uh, IEEE members who are at risk or have lost jobs. Uh, We've got various things that may be useful to those folks, uh, one of which is the uh, annual salary survey that we do. And we're offering IEEE members who lost their jobs, particular five free uses of the IEEE USA salary calculator to see how they would do it, uh, versus uh, other people who took the survey. So get kind of a ranking or say a woman, see if she's getting paid the same that men would get paid, various sorts of things that you could do with that. Um, also for those who are uh, contractors and consultants, the IEEE USA has this consultant finder uh, where people can look for uh, various projects and gigs. They can upload a profile, uh, making it easy for companies and clients to find them. There's the uh, URL for that. And uh, again, we mentioned before that uh, we know there are members who are uh, at risk. And so we've got a dedicated resource page uh, for members who either lost their job or they're, uh, they're afraid they're in danger of becoming unemployed. And that is, uh, that's the URL uh, down there at the very bottom. Next slide. Also, uh, uh, we've got things that are just for fun. I mentioned before, uh, for instance, my uh, my webinar on making beer. Um, but we also have some interesting ebooks. Um, most of our ebooks are our uh, career and public policy topics. But we've got some more interesting lighter titles as well, including um, our engineering coloring book. It's not really for kids; it's for adults too. Um, you know, adults sometimes like coloring books. We also have engineering crossword puzzles, and we have our first graphic novel. The Slate Twins, Caught in the Currents. Um, and uh, these are free now, too. Uh, and uh, we also have uh, some curated third-party resources that are available at, uh, at that help page we talked about before. Uh, for instance, things to help keep your kids, look, help them with their STEM education and uh, get them interested in technology and its applications, um, but also how to, where to find stream, streaming movies, music, podcasts, learning a language, and various other things. Next slide. So what else is IEEE doing? This is the bigger IEEE. Um, IEEE has a, 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 a monthly magazine, which is also available online called Spectrum. And uh, there's a select archive of COVID related resources that are uh, on this uh, uh, bit.ly uh, link you could see there. That's being updated weekly. There's also a, a general COVID-19 resource page. Uh, the IEEE Learning Network, which mentioned before, we've got an awful lot of resources uh, from conferences, um, from uh, uh, webinars and various things on a lot of different technical topics as well as career development, things of that sort. Uh, those are now available through I IEEE uh, a Learning Network, ILN, and actually the price of these uh, to members has been reduced by 70%. And then, of course, there's IEEE Explore, and as I mentioned before, uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, COVID and pandemic-related um, explore articles. These are technical, um, professional technical articles that related to COVID-19 that are free to access 
for the duration of the of the current crises. I think that's the last one. Let's see if there's another slide. Oh yeah, there's one more. So uh, stay updated. Uh, you can follow IEEE USA um, if you're a member or if you'd like to learn more about IEEE USA. Uh, we're updating our social feeds uh, several times a day, and we like it if you like us, and also share useful information. I try to retweet stuff I get, for example. So there's our uh, uh, the web page you talked about here before. There's the uh, insights, and uh, uh, we hope if you're an IEEE member that you will take uh, make use of this, and uh, we're here to help. And if you're not a member, uh, we're glad to be able to tell you a little bit about IEEE and IEEE USA. Thank you very much, Ken. I'm on mute. Uh, so You're on mute. Great, great presentation, Tom. <laughs> one of the things that was, one of the, two takeaways. One takeaway: uh, I, being an IEEE member, it's worth it just for the ebook uh, alone. It sounds like, and yeah. then you know, kind of transitioning to to uh, Matt. Um, I think Ross Lieberman probably wants to sign up for that webinar on beer. I don't ah, think so. That's <laughs> that's excellent, excellent sure. choice. <laughs> and and as as I queue up the presentation for Matt, uh, I just have a quick question for you, um, Tom. On um, uh, you know a little bit about the membership. I mean, it's the Institute of Electrical Engineers, and why don't you tell us a little bit about the organization and and, and you know a little oh, you bit more bet. background. Oh, I'm glad to do that. Yeah, IEEE actually uh, uh, is uh, the initial stand for the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers. Though I think numbers I've seen is like. Uh, you know, only about 50% of the members are, you know, electronic or electrical engineers, and the rest of them are a whole bunch of other disciplines. You know, my bachelor degree was in physics, um, and I've done a bunch of stuff on magnetic recording. That's my background, magnetic recording and storage. But there's people from a whole bunch of different disciplines. And the history of the organization is actually, this is a, a one of the oldest technical uh, uh, engineering organizations in the world. It actually uh, dates back to... Uh, the American Institute of Electrical Engineers that was founded by a few folks that people have heard of, like Thomas Edison and Alexander Graham Bell. Um, that And they combined with another group, which, which was uh, uh, the Institute of Radio Engineers, which was formed in the early 20th century, back around, if I remember right, 1963, uh, to form a, uh, a broader organization that covered all these disciplines and more. And like I say, you know, we've got people who are involved in biology, people who are involved in physics. Uh, people that are uh, uh, in software. Um, we've got a computer society. We've got a whole mess of different uh, uh, technical societies and communities, and we're working on the the forefront of technologies. Uh, you know, IoT, five uh, G networks. Um, you know, the future of computing, quantum computing, um, uh, direct interface uh, with the brain, electronics and the brain. Just all manner of interesting topics. You know, if if it is interesting, we're there. If it's interesting as technical, we're involved in it. So uh, just a little bit about IEEE. Well, thank you, Tom. I appreciate that presentation. And clearly, uh, Alexander Graham Bell was uh, one of the pioneers of using electronics for communications. And yep. Matt Polka, your uh, members have been doing that for a long, long time as well, uh, primarily with video. So Matt, why don't you tell us a little bit about what the ACA is for those members, maybe people who are IEEE uh, USA members, for instance, who are, might be on the watching the video. Tell us about ACA and then tell us what your members are doing. Sure. Well, good to see you again, Ken. I think the last time you and I were together in person, we were in Las Vegas together at the NCTC's Winter Educational Conference. Uh, we maybe even talked on video then about what's this COVID-19 crisis and Will it really hit the U.S.? And we thought, no, nah, probably not. Uh, but here we are uh, about six weeks or so later. Uh, we're all uh, becoming uh, quite accustomed to what is a new normal, uh, not only in business, but also in what we do at ACA Connects. We're an organization that's been around since 1993, uh, representing the interests uh, of smaller independent providers. First, we started out with uh, small businesses in, in the cable industry. And then over time, as technology developed, that moved into both phone and now broadband, where we consider ourselves primarily broadband providers that also provide phone and internet service, uh, as well as video service. But we're in smaller towns and rural areas, as you'll hear from our, our chairman, Patty Boyers. Uh, you'll see that uh, our locations are very, very rural, small towns, rural areas, really where the country is talking about <clears throat> making sure that we have broadband connections in the most remote parts of our country. 
our job is really one uh, of regulation, legislation, advocacy. Uh, we are a trade association of sorts where an ACA connects, uh, which we also call America's Communications Association. We represent uh, around 800 smaller companies uh, that are in the video, phone, and broadband business. And we do the work for our members in Washington, D.C., where we represent their interests primarily before Congress, the, com the Commerce Committees in, in particular, uh, as well as the FCC, and really with any other uh, agency, commission of the like uh, in Washington, D.C. that has anything to do with uh, communications or business issues that, that affect our members. Uh, we're a strong voice uh, and advocate for those companies, and we want to make sure that those companies are viable and able to serve uh, their communities, their customers, uh, and to be able to invest and innovate and deploy more services. So as an advocacy organization, you know, our job is to connect with Washington, but as things changed really with, uh, with COVID-19, uh, we realized that our mission has changed uh, quite a lot in the last six, seven weeks. The, the, the first impact that we saw was with uh, an annual event that we do in Washington called our ACA Connect Summit, which is where we bring our members to Washington to actually go lobby Congress and the FCC well, we were kind of really on the, the, the crest of the wave as this crisis began to build in our country. Uh, and we, unfortunately, at the time, we had to make the decision to, to, to reschedule the event and then uh, actually cancel it because we saw how big this problem, this crisis was going to be. So for us, we, we quickly realized that our job was going to have to be education, uh, help to provide information, help to work with our members, find out their needs, and to communicate not only back and forth among the membership, but also with Washington, D.C. Uh, but one of the one of the first goals that, that we set out for ourselves was to provide information that our members need to know and to have that updated for them on a daily basis. So we created a number of things. What you're seeing now is, is the headline page of what we called COVID-19 Central. Uh, and this is a daily e <coughs> email that we send to our members to provide news that they need to <coughs> they need to know about issues that are taking place. So as we go to the next slide, you can see that we also focus on uh, a number of important events. Uh, go ahead, Ken, if you get the chance. Uh, we also provide a number of important events for our members. We have provided uh, webinars. We've provided discussions. We've had Chairman Pai from the FCC on a webinar, we've had uh, congressmen, uh, we've had our members come together to, to focus on best practices. As you can see, some of the things that we've announced this week, uh, there was a, a webinar earlier today on the legal uh, aspects of getting back to work and what employers need to know about before we get back to what is the new normal and what that new normal may be like. We also have what we call Zoom meetings with our members where our members join us and our staff each week, several times a week, and basically, it's it's just a conversation where we're asking, hey, what's it what's it what's going on in your world, and how can we best help you? Uh, in addition, we try to highlight a number of good stories. You can go to the next slide, Ken. Uh, and there have been so many. I mean, I think that has been one of the great things that we have learned uh, throughout this crisis about what our members are doing and how they're really truly helping, not only keep Americans connected, but in this case, uh, with Ryan Pitcher, one of our technicians from Atlantic Broadband, actually saving lives you know, literally where he was able to do that one day while he was uh, working and saw a nearby house fire and went into action to, to save four people that were inside that home. Uh, so many tremendous stories. And I think that's been one of the unsung things about the crisis to see so many good things happening, not only from a business perspective and how we're connecting people that weren't connecting before, uh, but also wonderful ways that, that our members are connecting with their communities. In addition, uh, we knew that information was gonna be so critical. You can go ahead, Ken. And that's why we created on our homepage uh, a specific page to cover COVID-19 resources. Uh, you see the website link there, acaconnects.org backslash COVID-19, where uh, within that site, we have a, a number of, of very, very critical but up-to-date resources. Go to the next one, Ken, which is something that is important even today. Uh, this comes from our uh, COVID-19 CARES Act stimulus page, where not only here through these buttons, but also below, there is a significant amount of information, government resources, et cetera, on where our members can find 
financial resources, primarily through the Small Business Administration Payroll Protection Program, the SBA's Economic Injury Disaster Loan Emergency uh, Loan Program, something of which, uh, Patty, who you'll hear from here in a few minutes, just did a, a video for us on both of those programs and the success of her company. Many resources to say, look, we know you're busy, but the government is, is, here, is here actually to help, and there are ways that you can get that resource. Go to the next one. You'll see a picture of Patty doing a, a video outside of, of her home recently for us, and she'll have a lot more to say about what she does in, in her company. To the next slide, uh, Ken, we have been able to feature you know, not only input from, from our staff at ACA Connects on important uh, information. This blog that I had the opportunity to write here this week talks about th there have to be eight to 10 great stories of, of our members connecting with students and schools. And, and it is such a tremendous story uh, that it's really something that we want to promote as widely as we can because it just it, it is it's just so great to be able to, to toot the horn of our members. But you also hear directly from our members, uh, such as I'm on communications and, and how they're handling communications. Uh, keep going. That's fine. Um, the next slide, and I think it's the last one I have, although you may run the video behind us, is is uh, a, a, a number of PSAs that we have made available to our members. And you'll see the video here while, while I continue to talk. Uh, and we put these together with the help of one of our members, Frankfurt Plant Board, uh, in Frankfurt, Kentucky, as well as one of our associate, uh, associate members via media that works with our members to put together a short 30 second video that's available to our members to say, hey, we're here for you. We're, 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 we are committed to connecting uh, our communities, to connecting you uh, and to be with you every step of the way. And so that's what we've been doing at ACA Connects and we're very, very proud to do it. Matt, that's, uh, that's terrific. Um... Let me stop sharing here. It's uh, the blog post that uh, you wrote. I think it was yesterday. Yes. About about that balance. You know, it touted the things your members are doing, but at the same time, uh, making sure that as the government gets involved in these things, that they're doing so in a way that leverages the private investment and the private efforts that are already happening. Yeah, it's a really important point. Um, and we can talk about this a little bit later if we transition to some policy issues. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, our members have been committed to connecting their communities, investing, innovating, deploying for years now. Uh, and we believe that, that, that they were able to do so because of what we've been able to fight for at ACA Connects on their behalf over the years. And that is a lighter touch of regulation that has allowed them uh, to, to receive access to capital, uh, and then use that capital in ways that, that are making a difference by way of deploying broadband further in their community. So unbeknownst to us, as this crisis has befallen all of us, when the time came for our country to leave the office and to go home uh, and to be online every day, we were there ready to meet it because of what our members were able to do and because of a regulatory policy system that actually allowed them to do that, to recover their costs as they've, they've built their networks, they've expanded their networks, they've been able to recover their costs, but also to meet this need. So we're, we're very, very pleased. And we think that this is, uh, this is evidence of not only the, the right regulatory policy, uh, but a job well done by our members. Well, and speaking of members, uh, we have Patty who could probably uh, speak to this, what you just spoke of, she can probably is the poster child for it because she and her husband brought cable TV where cable TV didn't exist, right? It was totally empty and uh, she has created something and it's a, it's an amazing story. And Patty, why don't you tell us a little bit about Boycom Vision and, and how you got started. And then we'll talk a little bit about the, the COVID you know, how it's impacting you and, and so forth. But why don't you start with with uh, where you're at? Well, Southeast Missouri is a long way from the ocean, Ken. We have, <laughs> no, we have no beachfront property for sale, unless it was Wapapella Lake, which I wouldn't want to own any of that. But uh, uh, we are the furthest state away from any ocean that there is. We're smack dab in the middle of the state. And uh, we're in that flyover country that y'all out there on the West Coast like to call it. 
So, uh, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're very rural. I serve uh, in five counties that are deemed perpetually impoverished, which means that the uh, overall annual medium household income of the folks in these five counties is below the poverty level since 1960 census. So we, we've got some unique, uh, we have some unique uh, demographics, socioeconomic situations, uh, and uh, and so it's a challenge. Uh, we serve where the big guys don't want to be. You know, they can't make any money uh, with all their levels of management and hierarchy and support all of these uh, investors. I've got two investors in my business, and that's me and my husband and the mortgage on my home. So my financing is a lot different than the financing. You know, we have long-term relationships with community banks. And we have been a long time borrower with SBA. Uh, in fact, we've had three that we have um, paid off years ago and, uh, and just got a new one to refinance and, and build up some more, do a complete fiber uh, rebuild of our, of our flagship system right here in Butler County. And, uh, and we were a recipient of a PPP uh, loan that we applied for and got. Uh, those are, you know, SBA of all the government entities, and I have a, you know, a USDA or US uh, broadband loan as well. And uh, SBA by far is the best if you could have a good government agency to partner up with. SBA is they let you do your business, they let you conduct your business. And uh, I can't say that for the real utility services. In fact, don't get me going with that one because I'd have to censor this, you know. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure we're live and somebody's listening and I really don't give a flying. <laughs> but, but nonetheless, uh, you know, we are, uh, we are first time cable operators. We're first generation. Steve and I built our first system from scratch. And we just picked out a community like my house that didn't have cable. And, and that was uh, 1992 or something? 1992. We'd been underground contractors for several years since 1979. We'd worked for Southwestern Bell. We had a contract for Contel back in those days, for GTE back in those days. Uh, and then we kind of morphed into the buried cable and I had a master contract with Triax USA, of which we were the first underground fiber contractor for them did the very first fiber optic job in uh, Michigan, tying Lansing in all the way to Detroit across uh, Highway 69, what they call Grand River uh, uh, Highway. And, uh, you know, we, we, we Steve, inv developed a hydraulic reel carrier that would roll the, you know, back in those days, you couldn't cut that fiber. Oh, my God, the fiber, you couldn't splice fiber. I mean, there wasn't anything you could do in 1989 and 1990 because you, right. you cut that son again, you were in trouble because it was incredibly expensive to, you know, the big jelly packs and all the crap that you had to have and, and not that way anymore, you know, fiber's cheaper than coax now. So uh, my, how things have changed. But uh, uh, so we had our feet big time wet in the underground business. In fact, we did uh, some cross, we did a, had a boring division that did cross country solid rock bores with dynamite in the big directional boring machines that would, blow holes underneath the highway and pits for uh, cost crunchy uh, high pressure gas mains and things like that. We did that simultaneously while we were uh, burying cable in Michigan. Mm. And that's where we got our seed money to get cable to my house. And it just kind of morphed into Boycom. Uh, we started, you know, Steve started driving around with that house doesn't have cable. This house doesn't have cable. And so uh, we came up with a whole system outside the city limits of Popper Bluff was our first system that we built from scratch. That was in 1993. So uh, the rest is history, my friend. We've just gotten to a business. My husband's a master plumber, uh, and that's always been his. Uh, but he's kind of like Tammy Wynette. You know, she was a country singer, but she always kept her cosmetology license. Correct. That's right, she did. In case she had to go back to the beauty shop to get a, make a living. So uh, Steve's, uh, to this day, keeps his plumbing license hanging on the wall. But, well, there's something uh, in common there. A lot of people say the internet is as essential as plumbing these days. Well, I would so. say it's probably more essential. You know, uh, <laughs> I can't get Steve to plumb. I haven't been able to for 25 years. I have to call somebody. But, uh, <laughs> you know, he can do it if he had to. 
but uh, and we've always been the cable, uh, the, the, the cattle business too. My dad farmed and we raised cattle when I was a kid and uh, Steve's dad raised cattle. And so we've always raised cattle, raised a big garden. You know, it, it is an incredibly rural life that we live, but uh, uh, all these people are talking about going back to, uh, going back to nature, buddy, we've already been there. So and I've been preparing for COVID-19 all my life, I guess. Well, and there's a picture of uh, some of your girls, I think you said. Yep, yep. Those are my yearling heifers that have just had their first baby calves. And I think this picture here, I, I, I think this one would be an interesting one for you to speak to. It oh looks like gosh. he's from Mars. Oh, my gosh. That's, that, that's Billy Hudson, uh, one, of our, uh, one of our fiber techs. Uh, early on, um, you know, and, and, we, and we've been able to get some PPE equipment now that we have, but early on, very first, the president made his speech on that Monday, what was it, the 15th or 14th of March, and the very next day, we had our meeting, and we closed our front door, and we we decided that we, because I, Ken, I don't run a deep bench. I don't have 2,500 or 3,500 employees. I got 17, and that counts me and Steve, and so if if I've got one quarterback and he, and he gets sick, buddy, I'm in trouble. Uh, so we were we were mostly in, uh, worried about keeping our employees safe, and so we closed our front door and uh, and we initiated an outside policy for the guys and inside policy for the girls, and then I also initially initially initiated what I called the ped slash pole to the porch policy, and uh, that's something that we have learned that we can do about ninety five percent. That's old Billy again. About ninety five percent of our installs we can do from the ped and the porch except our fiber to the home installs, which was what Billy was all suited up for. Uh, Gamble Laboratories, which is uh, an independent lab that operates under the Quest label here in town was just getting ready to get started with their COVID-19 testing, very first lab in town. And their CEO and all of their upper echelon people were being sent home to work. Well, their their CEO, Bobby Brown, it just bought a new home in the fiber to the home subdivision of which we're the only operator. And uh, he said, man, I, I've got to get this hooked up. Well, you know, you can't just stick that through the a window and say, here, hook it up yourself. So, um, you know, we, there's no way to sit in the driveway and, and, and step somebody through. So he said, if I get you the PPE equipment, will you suit your guy up and send him in? And I said, shoot. Yeah. So he did. And he provided us, uh, three outfits, just what you see uh, Billy dressed in, and Billy goes in, and, and this is a text from Bobby, from Bobby Brown, the CEO of Gamma Labs, you know, he was fantastic, so he thanked him, and now he's operating the largest laboratory in Butler County from home on Boycom Fiber, so I'm mm. proud of that, you know, that's something we were able to do, we've worked very well with our communities, we're in the process right now of setting up uh, of long-term hotspots uh, at three strategic church parking lots out in the county for oh. our school children in our R1 school district so that they can they can go to those areas and, and it's it's not like what you think of as a hot spot. They're developing classrooms in the parking lot where they're going to have a live teacher and they're going to be able to hook up right then and the kids are going to attend from their cars. It's not like you go online but it's going to be online but it, it's a little bit it's a little bit different uh, platform that they're going to be operating from. And so we're in the process of doing that. And uh, I can knock on some good solid wood here and say that so far our policies have paid off. All of our people are still well. Everybody is still operating. Our installs are up by 37 percent. And so far our receivables are holding, which is a which is something that we were deeply concerned about. And we took that FCC pledge and proud to do it. Uh, because we are entrepreneurs and we are on the front line out here. Independent, uh, independent providers like us, uh, we are the front line. We are the folks that are standing in that gap between the metropolitan and the suburban areas and that massive landmass out there of the great unwashed who don't have internet. So if, if you're going to get it to those folks, you got to go through us to get it. And uh, that, that's, you know, we're out there on the front line. I'm kind of curious on the hot spot. Are you seeing quite a few of the kids coming in from outside your service area to use those Wi-Fi hotspots that are in the schools, but just don't happen to be in your service yeah, area? That's true. We're having kids from town come to our hotspots. And that's, and, they're and supposed we, to have good internet there, I assume. Well, yes, they do have good internet because, you know, one of my, my ACA 
uh, vice chair serves the city limits of Poplar Bluff, which is Caleb One. And uh, those people have the ability to, uh, they have hot spots that uh, Mike and his folks are providing for the, the school district as well. This is a big, massive undertaking that they're doing, that they're going to continue ongoing once school comes back into session next fall. And then they're going to do summer school this way. And so this isn't just a quick fix, throw it on a pole and plug it into a power supply. This is, a, this is going to be an ongoing because they have determined through a survey in our school district alone that there is 38% of the kids do not have access to broadband. So wow. uh, that being said, um, I mean, that's a problem. That's a problem. I don't know if they can't afford it. I don't know if, I know there are lots of companies doing the um, uh, entry level uh, for students. Uh, we have not done that. Um, we have been able to reach out and provide some scholarships for some families to have the internet. We've done that on a case by case basis um, of folks that we know can't pay for it and won't ever be able to pay for it. Even at an entry level, we just went and turned them on for 60 days. So we're not broadcasting that, but we're doing it for our customers and our maybe, you know, current, I mean, uh, future customers, maybe somebody will get their job back and we can help them do that. But in the meantime, um, in the meantime, we're just being creative. We're trying to be creative, we're tr but our network, I'm telling you what, has seen a 70% increase. Wow. Plant. What used to be a Friday night, Saturday night, bump up to the max. We're seeing it all day long now. And of course, we're we're splitting nodes and bringing in uh, more fiber overlash and doing everything we can do to get. But then also got to remember that in our part of the country transport into our areas. Uh, you know, we have some, but we certainly don't have a robust pipe coming from any direction that's going to give us what they've got in downtown St. Louis. So. That being said, we're just we're being innovative and we're being creative and we're being consistent and uh, and, and we're going to prevail. Oh, that's a terrific over, overview, uh, Patty. It gave me several questions and I don't want to make me you know monopolize the questioning. So if anyone has a question, uh, please jump in. But one thing you touched upon and for those people who aren't familiar with it, and obviously you are Mac and address this, but the Keep America Connected pledge. Uh, do one of you want to address, you know, what exactly that is and, and how many members are taking that? Well, I will tell you that we were asked by the FCC um, chairman, uh, Jit Pai, if our organization would take this pledge. And that pledge was not to, uh, not to have flight fees, not to disconnect people for non-pay, and for, for 60 days, uh, the pledge was six days. Matt, jump in here if I screw this up. And, uh, you know, to, to take off any throttling and any, any kind of uh, turn everything up wide open so that everybody that needed it could get the service. And <clears throat> Boycom Cablevision was right there on the spot, first one to sign up. And, uh, and I have no problem doing that because, but I, I know a lot of these other companies have a lot bigger concern. They got more, uh, more uh, you know, investors, other people like that. But everybody has come around. ACA supported it. Uh, and uh, and everybody's living it. And I will tell you that uh, just in late fees alone, it's a substantial hit in 30 days' time. You know, there's a lot of people in our system that could, could they pay for 14, 15 months of service every 12 months because they have all the late fees. But, you know, that's the, I guess that's their, hmm. their economic way of life. And, uh, and then the not disconnecting for non-pays, those kinds of situations. We've, uh, we all pledged not to do that. And it's holding. It's holding. And it's been successful, I think. Matt, what do you think? Patty, you're right on target. Uh, everything you said about the pledge is correct. We've had hundred. I mean, of our, of our 800 members, we've had several hundred. I don't even know the number because it's such a large number that have, uh, that have taken the pledge, uh, which, as Patty uh, outlined, talks about you know, late fees, no disconnects, no throttling, taking away data caps, things of that nature. But what, what has been really so gratifying to see is whether whether our member companies actually you know said i will take the pledge so to speak uh it, it doesn't mean that the others didn't uh and it doesn't mean that the others aren't serving their communities they were doing that before uh and, and this crisis has really 
brought our members and their customers and their communities together in ways that, as I say, when, when you read the stories in our COVID-19 Central or our daily media sweep that's produced by Ted Hearn, our VP of Communications, you see the stories of what our members are doing to connect. I mean, literally working with schools to make students, uh, to, to make broadband available to students that never did have it before, as Patty talked about. Uh, the, the thing about our, our members, which is truly unique, but it, it's also such a wonderful story, uh, it, is really the, the, the connection that they do have. It's one of the reasons why we say in our organization that you know we are ACA Connects, America's Communications Association, because that's what our members do, and that's what they they have done forever, because they're part of their communities in unique ways that uh, that that larger companies just aren't. Uh, and so we've seen wonderful stories that have come by as a result of companies that have taken the pledge, and even those that haven't, but that are still meeting the needs today. Well, uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, I mean, I think there's multiple uh, uh, layers to this onion of, of getting kids connected. One of them, of course, having the accessibility to the broadband, um, but then there's the affordability aspect of it. But then there's the device part. And this may tie into where the IEEE USA could come in. But I know there's also members have been uh, putting out an amazing number of Chromebooks, retrofitting, whatever, to get out to their communities. And uh, it seems like that device thing probably is as much a bottleneck as anything. Making and, and we're making strides. I mean, as a result of this the crisis, you have our member companies as broadband providers all across the country now working with school districts to say, what's it going to take for us to get uh, Chromebooks or get laptops or get iPads or whatever to make available to students now because they need it because they're home now. So th this crisis in many ways has also created wonderful opportunities to identify those students that actually don't have the devices, that don't have what they need, not only the device, but also the connection. And then you see the school districts working together with the ISPs to actually connect those students. And that's, that's a tremendous thing. We had a wonderful story that just appeared here this last week, uh, one of our members, Vast Broadband, which actually is based not too far from where Patty is in Sykeston, Missouri, but they have uh, systems mm. up in, in South Dakota. Uh, and South Dakota Broadcasting, Public broad, Broadcasting, uh, just a story that, that we published in, in, in our communications as well about a, a, a South Dakota University professor who, frankly, was using you know her phone, LTE, et cetera, to try to connect with her students. Just couldn't do it. Vast Broadband came in, connected the professor. She has connections to all of her students. They're doing online classes they're getting the job done because of the need. So our members are identifying where that need exists, finding ways to, to, to make that connection and then solving the problem. I've kind of come to this idea in the last uh, week, really, this idea that school districts need to, you know, moving forward, need to think of, of a virtual school, if you will, I mean, as part of the physical infrastructure, but that doesn't necessarily mean you build it like you build a school campus, but you, you know, you, you, it's not a buyer, it's a buyer make decision, right? It's a, you, you buy it, right? Because you clearly don't want to build a broadband network, but what are your thoughts on that interview? I, I think, I think you're absolutely right. Um, you know, it's, it's like I said, you know, uh, out of, out of a problem, um, out of necessity comes uh, a solution uh, and, and comes a resolution the problems that, that exist. Now, don't get me wrong. I mean, there's a lot more work to do. Uh, this is a big country. Patty knows this in, in, in her markets, which as she said, are, are, are deemed to be you know perpetually imp impoverished. So these are very, very remote, uh, ec economically challenged areas, which is you know quite typical of where our, our members live and work, but they're, but they're finding ways to connect. And, and, and that's what is so awesome about this is that Despite the, the 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 problem that we all face, and there are many, not 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 the least of which is the health crisis, but also economic job losses, etc. But we are finding ways that students can connect, that businesses can continue to operate, that work can get done, that telehealth can actually be more encouraged. I mean, things that existed before that now we we really have to do on an ongoing basis. I mean, heck, I'm in this business. I had my first telehealth. Uh, uh, appointment a couple of weeks ago. And you know what? It, it was awesome. I mean, it was very useful for, for that need at that time. But I, it, in our areas, it's even more critical 
where, where you need to have the providers, but you also need to have the network. Uh, the other thing I would say, too, is that, that we're, we're looking forward to announcing some, some great uh, uh, statistics this, this coming week in a report that we're going to make available to the FCC. Uh, but the FCC has asked us to, to keep track of our, our members' network management and, and how, well, how well their networks are holding up. We're doing the work. We're doing the survey. We're doing the economic analysis. Uh, and we're finding out that our, our members' networks are managing the load. And, and not just managing, but managing with, with flying colors. Um, and that, again, goes a lot to what had to take place before this, uh, before this crisis. If, if our members were not able, I mean, literally, collectively, to invest billions of dollars to create these networks, we wouldn't be where we are today with this terrific story. It would be a far different story and one that was far worse. But we, we invested, we put the money into the ground uh, and, and on the poles, and now we're, we're meeting the need. Yeah, you had to design for that peak, that Friday night peak, and now you've literally flattened the curve, haven't you? It's like this every day, every day. Yeah. Yeah. I'm more like hitting the ceiling. Is what right. <laughs> exactly. So this is Tom. Back that school thing, Ken, just to, just to drop in there and bring Tom into the conversation, is that we're always, you know, the, the engineering side of it is, mm -hmm. uh, is crucial as well because what we're finding in our particular little school district, our kids already had all those little MacBooks but there are MacBooks and the world runs on Microsoft, not on, you know, they don't run on, on Macintosh. And so uh, that's where their problem is. That's, 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 that's where the school district's problem is, but they, how they got those little old uh, kids that did not have internet connection at home. They, uh, they provided these after school and late bus runs and that kind of thing. So those kids can stay in school, stay connected after school. So they left them, then they just leave their MacBooks at school because they had no internet connection at home. And so uh, where they're, what they're finding now is that they've got to be able to do that for everybody. And, uh, and, that, and so we're out there and they're trying to decide what, uh, you know, what platform, what electronics, how it is they think they really want to do it because this is going to be a long game. It's not just going to be throw up a hot spot and going to be a long game. And so we're going to work hand in hand with our partner, Cable One, and see what we can all come up with to help, you know, and that's that engineering side of it comes into it, you know, very much so. So I'm actually on my MacBook right now. Uh, <laughs> well, you can just, I, I'll turn right here and just turn my Microsoft to you. Right? <laughs> yeah, they can fight. I saw you grin when I said that, but, you know. <laughs> so um, it's on the engineering side of things, you know, there's a, what, what I think, because I've been paying attention to some of the stuff's going on. First of all, the kind of traffic that you're getting now is probably very different than what you got in the past. There's a lot more uploading yes. than just downloading, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, if this goes on for a while, a lot more people are going to be familiar. First of all, it is amazing that the infrastructure has uh, stood up to provide what it's provided so far. And, um, you know, I think we're going to end up uh, uh, working a lot of bugs out of the remote conferencing and interaction capability because we've got to. More and more people are going to be familiar with these tools. And I would project that if this goes on for very, for very long, that it is going to fundamentally change the way that people do many things that they do today in person. You know, there'll be a lot more capability, a lot more familiarity and comfort with doing online interactions, you know, and using video or perhaps even, you know, uh, if as bandwidth capabilities go up, uh, uh, virtual reality, artificial reality, where you can, it can seem like you're actually in the room with somebody potentially. So um, I think this is going to be very interesting. This is going to, uh, in a sense, it is leading to a greater use of communication to solve physical issues. Um, my wife's actually a school nurse, and one of the things she was talking about, uh, first of all, they just, last night, her school district made a decision. They weren't gonna go back to physical school uh, before the end of this, this year, right? They only had a few weeks left. But when they do go back, it's like, uh, if you're gonna do social distancing in a school, how are you gonna do that? I actually thought that idea of uh, having a place, if the weather permits it, you know, to, for, kids to go outside, drive up someplace and do it. It was an interesting idea, but yeah, we're going to have to uh, use these kind of uh, the technical tools we've got to get around some of the issues we've got. To, if we continue to have this kind of crisis and, uh, you know, the pandemic issues uh, to be able to resolve that. And the technology is the way we're going to do it. 
one of the things you mentioned, the virtual reality and the uh, Matt, I noticed the organization you're a board member of, um, and you can talk to that organization, but I, and this is a, this is a problem. I'm a tabber. I end up seeing a link and I think it's interesting. And there was a very good article um, uh, about surviving the pandemic. And one of the things, the article was on Zoom burnout and, you know, the idea yeah. of, you know, you get exhausted at the end of the day. And one of the thesis behind this article is you need to stand up. You need to actually, your body's part of it. And I noticed Ajit Pai in a, a, call, on a webinar a couple of weeks ago, he was standing up with his big Reese's mug. But, um, but th th it gets to your point, Tom, about this idea of being able to interact kind of in real world uh, mm -hmm. manner. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think it's going to be, after this, I think it's going to be more of a trend. We're actually going to be more dependent upon these electronic communication technologies after this is over than than we ever were before, I think. I agree. And, I, I, I oh, think that's right, uh, Ken, Ken and, and Tom. Um, uh, and there's value. There's there's tremendous value that we're all obtaining from the use of these means, which great minds have created, which people like Patty have built by way of the networks, et cetera. Um, I, I do hope we can come back to some, some measure of normalcy where we can interact. Uh, I, I know I have, uh, and Patty too, because she's she's been with me on a lot of trips and vice versa. Uh, you know, there's nothing better for me in, in, in what I do than to get out and to see our members in the mm -hmm. communities where they live and work uh, mm -hmm. and to talk to them about uh, their communities, uh, th their culture, uh, and how they're, 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 they're so much of the fabric of the community. So uh, I miss it. I haven't been on a plane since the end of February, which for me is like forever. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I don't know when I'll get back on one. It could be quite some time. But I, I do hold out hope that, I, that we'll all have the chance to get back together uh, and I'll get the, the have, have the chance to visit our members again because uh, it's tremendous. I've been I've been to Patty's place. I've been uh, I've been in in in, uh, in on her farm, and it is a tremendous place to visit. So I want to definitely get back there and to other our members as well. Well, I'm just a lot more impressive in person. <laughs> What's impressive is you, the 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 operation you're running there. How many cattle do you have? Did you say? We've got 125 mama cows, which we do a cow calf operation which means that we have a herd of, of female cows that huh. have calves every year. And so we run registered bulls and uh, uh, run our cattle. And then we keep the heifer calves and we sell the steers. We also have, um, we also have a little side deal of, uh, we do deep freeze beef and we feed, no pun intended, that, you know, that uh, division of our beef operation, we feed that with the heifers that uh, that we have on full feed, and then they go through a process and uh, you know get checked by the vet. And if they're not if they're not appropriate for breeding, then they get slapped in that get a hundred days worth of finishing feed, and off to the butcher they go. Hmm. So uh, you know we haven't had I haven't purchased beef in I think about twenty seven years. We raise our own beef cattle and. All of our family, we feed our family and we feed our employees right now. We're feeding our employees. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, that's something that we can do. You know, I, I enjoy the cattle business. Steve, uh, we aren't really, we aren't too far, uh, too far uh, logistically from the golf course here in the Popper Bluffs, the premier golf course. Hmm. And we'll drive through it, you know, on our way up to the farm, pulling a cattle trailer. Or I'll be following Steve on the tractor with the bush hog or, Something like that. And we'll wave at all of our buddies on the city council and all that BS. And, and they'll say to us the next week, says, oh, my God, we can't believe you had to work Saturday. You should have been out playing golf. And I'll say, what in the hell are you talking about? That's the biggest waste of a good pasture is a golf course. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just telling you, you think about how many cattle you can put in Missouri now, in Missouri. It's uh, two and a half acres for a cow-calf operation. You could you could put a lot of cattle on that daggum golf course. Now, <laughs> it would be work if we had to play golf. That's work. We're, we're having fun. That's, that's our enjoyment. That keeps us as young as we could possibly be. But uh, we enjoy the cattle business. You know, and that's one of the things I enjoy about the ACA members and companies like yours, Patty, because you are so close to reality. I mean, we're so we sheltered in the big cities. Pardon? We are. 
we are reality. I just you are. That. And you have to be clever, right? You don't have, uh, you know, the best buy down the street or Target or whatever, right? That, that's exactly right. You know, the, the thing about it is, Ken, and I, and I say this in jest, but in all seriousness, when you, whenever you spend your life on a tightrope without a net, you learn how to keep your butt up on that wire. And that's what... <laughs> I told you, Tom, you were going to love me. I told you that. <laughs> um, that um, you know, I just, uh, if you keep your ass on the wire, that's all I can say. Because what, was that an FCC seven, word? <laughs> Is no that one of the seven words you just no, used? No, no. She, she's good there. She's oh, good okay, to go. Thank you. Yeah, I think also that's the name of a uh, of an animal, too. So. Exactly oh, okay. okay. And a few okay. politicians. <laughs> there you go. I'm one of the few people still monitoring it, I think, uh, these days. But um, Well, I, I really appreciate uh, everyone being on, on this call today. I mean, do you have any closing comments, uh, anything we're missing? I mean, there's a lot of stuff we could continue talking about, but I don't. it's 5.30, I know, in uh, Pittsburgh, I think, something like that. Well, I, I, oh, go ahead. ahead. No, 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 you're the boss. Go right ahead. No, I'm, I'm really not the boss, but uh, <laughs> I am having a good time as the chair of ACA. Uh, I know that poor old Matt really wonders what's going to come out of my mouth. He's getting a little more comfortable <laughs> with it, but uh, because he knows there's not a whole heck he can do about it. But nope. uh, I am enjoying it. It is it is a challenge. I'm only the second woman to ever chair this uh this organization is colleen amazing. i guess being the first huh right. you're the right. second yeah. wow it's the first and uh, I, you know i'm surrounded by a bunch of balding white guys but uh <laughs> past that, it's, it's awesome that we're all we all come from such diverse areas and di different places in the country but at the end of the day our customers are the most important thing for us mm -hmm. and to be able to provide because when that phone stops ringing you're done so as long as that phone's ringing, you've got customers and people that need your service. People have learned today through this COVID-19 what a blessing it is to have an independent provider in their area. Mm. They certainly have. Not to say the big guys don't do an all right job, but uh, you won't see those big guys' names on the back of every soccer T-shirt in town, every, every wrestling shirt in town, every softball team in town. We, we sponsor every everything prom the yearbooks uh the, the trap team everything that you can imagine it's got boycom vision on the back of it because we believe in our community and because those are our customers and they're supporting me and they're feeding my family so i'm going to support them and that kind of uh that kind of right down there in the middle of it is where it, it is where the rubber meets the road can and uh yeah we're on the front lines but i wouldn't have it any other way well, Patty, she's done a terrific job. Ken, uh, last year, Patty single-handedly, in my view, uh, changed the course of what was uh, kind of a, a path to, to a certain legislative outcome on, a, on an issue that's near and dear to our heart at ACA Connects, and that was retransmission consent. Uh, but we were fighting for the right of our members to be able to have the good faith rules apply to our buying group at the National Cable Television Cooperative. Uh, lawmakers really weren't interested in hearing uh, about that and about our plight uh, until Patty last June came and testified before him and basically said, here's the reality. There's what you heard, but let me tell you what the truth is. And it literally changed the nature of the debate to win something that's very, very important for our members. So she's done a terrific job and uh, with, with her leadership. But uh, what, what, what Patty demonstrates really every day is just really who our members are. Uh, and that, to me, is is something that's inspirational. That I've had the the ability and the privilege to represent for you know going on 24 years now almost. Uh, and that is members who are salt of the earth, uh, where we take their issues now. And and there are issues on the horizon. And I'll just kind of leave you with this: uh, there there are so many good stories that are happening right now as a result of broadband deployment and what our members have done here to meet the need. But that doesn't mean that it's going to be that way. I mean, there, there are those that uh, have a different point of view regarding our members as ISPs and think that they should be more highly, heavily regulated. Hmm. Uh, I think we can demonstrate that with what we've done and with what we've been able to do, that we've, we've met the need of our country. But if we change you know, that, that way of thinking to something that is much more highly regulatory, particularly for small ISPs, you're not going to have the connectivity that you desire. Uh, and so that's where our, our fight is. Uh, and we're, we're working through any number of proposals right now that uh, 
members of Congress are, are creating because of the, the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, and there will be a lot more for us to do. Ironically, at the end of last year, I'll just say this and be done. At the end of last year, I said to Patty and our board, well, we, we got the retransmission consent piece that we wanted to get done, thankfully, and it was a ter tremendous fight, but we, we were able to move it forward. I really don't know what we're going to do in 2020 because it's an election year. <laughs> you know, Last election, time you say that. Yeah, it's an election <laughs> year, and uh, who, you know, who knows? So there will be a few things here and there, but nothing major. Well, our plate is full through the end of the year and beyond, but we're happy to do it and committed to do it for our members every day. Well, before we go to Tom, I mean, how could there be a conversation with Matt and not talk retransmission? But we won't go too deep into that. But a question that you see on the Twitter sphere quite often is, well, gosh, um, you know, we're not getting all the major sports programming that we paid for and stuff, but we still have to pay for it in our cable bill. And it gets it just flows down. Maybe you can kind of talk to that process for a minute. Why you sure. know don't the cable bills come down even though we're it's, still it's having to watch It's a huge dogs? issue. Uh, it, it's a huge issue right now, and we hear from our members all the time about it. Uh, it, it is becoming more of a public issue, particularly when you see, uh, for instance, uh, other industries like the auto insurance industry, which mm -hmm. on its own uh, has, has given back billions of dollars in, in rebates and credits for auto insurance because we're not driving. I mean, I, literally I've been in quarantine for about six weeks and I've literally driven my car three times. I mean, yeah. just three times over that time. So it, it stands to reason to say, to ask that question, why, why are there not credits coming to consumers, uh, for retransmission consent, sports programming fees, et cetera. The, the question isn't answered yet. Uh, I, I will say that uh, a lot of the, the, the problem is really along the whole chain of content that goes all the way up to the top to the sports leagues. And then you have the sports programmers and the networks and the broadcast groups and the broadcasters that are all part of this chain for the payment of those rights fees that, that no one really wants to disturb at this moment because they say, well, the seasons aren't canceled, they're just suspended. So consequently, under co most contracts, national as well as regional and even broadcast they say well it, the, the programming hasn't been canceled yet so we don't owe anything downstream but I, I think that's a fairly untenable position if this goes longer uh, because you can see that sports is not going to come back uh, as quickly or, or as we would like uh, as you can see I've got my penguins jersey. <laughs> oh, oh you, yeah. you know I had to I had to do that for you Ken um, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I love to go to the hockey games. I went to a hockey game in early March, you know, and I thought to myself, even while I was there, you know, how long will this happen given the crisis? So, uh, you know, it, it, it is an issue. Uh, it is an issue that is gaining uh, more awareness, uh, not only in Washington, but also in the country. Uh, and I do hope that not only our members, but uh, their customers and others in, 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 uh, that are connected to this issue uh, will start to raise greater concern about the need for. Uh, consumers to have a break for something that they're not getting. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great explanation, uh, Matt. And I guess we'll have to continue to monitor this and see what happens in the in the content side. So, Tom, you've uh, probably gotten a fire hose worth of information about the uh, small oh. broadband ISPs here. So, it really what are your, what are yeah. your thoughts? Um, well, like I said before, you know, I think uh, uh, actually. Uh, the communication in general, it's the, f the fact that we're able to continue doing the things we're trying, we're doing, you know, uh, reflects, you know, the importance of the whole telecommunication industry. And that's uh, the small guys as well as the large guys, you know, it's, it really has. Uh, and um, and I think that uh, that dependence is not going to be going down. I think, as I said before, you know, what I'm seeing, what I'm thinking is, it, you know, physical travel is not going away. It's still good to see people in person. But I think people will be a lot more comfortable, you know, and especially if they if if they if they'd like to go somewhere, but they've got conflicts, for example, I, it's easier for me to take a few minutes to go to the, to go to a, my computer and talk to somebody than to take a day to fly out, say, from California to the East Coast and then come back. You know, it's like a day each way, plus whatever time it is to have your meeting, you know. So the idea that we could uh, develop these tools so they would be even more useful for us, you know could um you know eventually and it, i think the thing is that we're actually getting practice now you know and we're seeing how well the tools work and what works and what doesn't work right is that there'll be a greater demand 
for more capability in our communication system to handle more remote uh, interactions. And that includes education. It's going to include uh, business in general and it'll include uh, people's uh, relationships to each other. You can't replace seeing people in person, but um, I think people will be a lot more comfortable with the alternatives where those alternatives make a lot of sense. Yeah, definitely that serendipitous thing. Like it seems like every year we run into each other at CES 2020 and yeah. <laughs> we yeah. run into each other there more often than we do in person, even though we're in the same city. And speaking of broadband, I know I'm supposed to be wrapping it up, but I keep coming back to Patty. I want you to elaborate a little bit more on the fiber to the home project because you just won this uh, grant, 50 uh, 50 matching grant from the state of Missouri to expand your network, uh, improve it. Why don't you talk to that for a moment, if you would. Well, Ken, you know that a lot of areas that are not served or have uh, what they determine to be unserved based on speeds, uh, it's a lot of it's, all of it's in the rural areas. And it's, it's simply because, you know, there are the homes per mile passed, or like they say in Canada, that the poles per home passed. You know, how many poles does it take to get to your house? I mean, you're out here in areas that are very remote, uh, very impoverished and very remote. And so the only way to get this stuff out there is through a grant type program. And the state of Missouri uh, did their pilot program in 2019. It was a, just $5 million for the whole state. And it was a 50-50 split. And there were 16 of us that were successful. And we were able to do a project that will, that will go in front of 1,600 and some change homes in Ripley County, which is the county to the west contiguous to us incredibly impoverished area and uh you know like the entire population in the whole county is a little over twenty-seven thousand people whole county wow so it, it's uh homes are very far apart nobody they can't afford it uh and so uh that's where we're that's where we're going to spend our uh, our three hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. we got half of it's from the state and half it's from my back pocket and uh, then we're going to run it in front of these people's homes and get them some service. And it's really an incredibly rural area. Uh, to speak to uh, that, the state of Missouri will have another program next year and a program after that. And I truly believe that this getting this money in the hands of the states and then letting the states make those determinations is by far a more efficient way of, of doling out this, this money and... and um, and because the states know where their areas are much better than the federal government. So uh, uh, I'm looking, a lot of more states are doing that. And it's all coming down from the federal government and the states are filling it out. And uh, we were very appreciative to be a recipient. And we intend to invest the state of Missouri's money wisely. Excellent. Well, it sounds like it's an incredibly efficient uh, operation. It sounds like 200 bucks a home or something is the yep. investment, wow. and which is incredibly low um, relative to a lot of these project. So Patty, thank well, sure you. That's because we don't, we're, we've got a real narrow, we, we don't have a lot of people. Right. So uh, that being said, but to, in closing for, I don't know what it is that's buzzing, but in it's, it must be the cocktail hour on my, on my <laughs> cell phone's going off saying it's time to have a cocktail. Uh, but our industry as a whole, uh, especially the rural and the smaller providers, Kim, we've done so much for so long with so little. We are absolutely qualified to do everything with nothing at all. And I, and I, do, and I do believe that's what we're doing. Is that not right, Matt? We're absolutely very, true. One of the most, um, I, I've never, I've never in, in all my life encountered such an industry uh, that uh, as soon as you get that first piece of equipment out of that box after a UPS arrives, it's obsolete. <laughs> And, and it's time that I mean there's it, there's so much change and and so much upkeep and, and so much rolling out and we've got this 5g thing ahead of us and mm -hmm. there's just a lot of things it's uh i never knew a little, little farm girl would end up uh in the cable tv business but here i am well excellent way to to end the conversation it looks like matt's being called away for dinner so it's probably time to to, to end it that noticeable sorry yeah. no no i think that's great it's supposed to be a conversation so i will uh, get this online and and, and uh get tags i just i want to mention uh, two things upcoming uh, smart driving car summit on monday which i'm helping with uh which is autonomous vehicles so if you want to know uh, it's always entertaining. Alan Kornhauser from Princeton is uh, hosting it, and he is 
formerly from Pittsburgh, Matt, so you, you'll like this guy. And then next Friday uh, on the same bat channel, we've got Shirley Bloomfield and Tanya Sullivan. Tanya Sullivan will be talking virtual governance. And uh, they just had their legislative, I think, virtual legislative session. So I, I want to find out how that went. So kind of building on this theme. 